Aaron's Songs, written by Ned Roram, 25th of August, 1999. Aaron Copeland, who with Hitchcock and Borgay and a few marvelous others, now fate his hundredth birthday, was the father of American music. American music, for the moment, will be defined as music penned by Americans after 1925, eschewing the up-to-then German traditions admired by, say, Griffiths and McDowell, stemming from the economical leanness promoted by Nadia Boulanger, then coming to a close around 1955 when the serial killers took hold with a featureless canvas that could in no way be identified as national. If Virgil Thompson was the first to borrow native Kentucky tunes and treat them symphonically until finally, like Poulin in France, he composed his own folk music, so to speak, or so to sing. Copeland improved upon the practice, embellished it, taught it, and made it his own. Appalachian Spring, with its stress on spare harmony and homemade folk song, its dearth of counterpoint, its scoring without much doubling, and its fairly simple hand-clapping rhythms, defined American music for two generations. Isn't it interesting that this composer, raised as a well-off urban Jew, wrote exclusively about poorish rural Gentiles? Every artist is half child, half grown up. When the grown up wins out, the artist dies. Like all artists, Aaron was a child, but where some play at being grown up, Aaron's childishness had a frank visibility that I've never seen elsewhere, except perhaps in Ravel, of all people. Someday I must expand a theory about their resemblance in their target, if not in their arrows. For although Ravel was lush where Copeland was plain, both stressed the craft of Dippelmont, of stripping bare. And has it ever occurred to you that in their representational music they seldom portrayed the adult world? Ravel with his toys, his daftness, his affinity for animals, was l'enfant et la sortilège incarnate. Copeland's common man was an abstracted man, like his ballet personages, who were eternal adolescents in the wide open spaces. He was forever drawn to the pubescent realm of the tender land and the second hurricane. Both men were urbane. They knew everybody, but dwelt far from the madding crowd. Copeland in sophisticated innocence, Ravel in naive sophistication. But it is interesting, too, that since children's music is inevitably sung music, how little vocal works there are by Copeland. Beyond the two brief operas just mentioned, what is there? Well, the first extant manuscript is a one-page fragment named Lola, composed at age 14, and there were a couple of songs from the late 20s and some little choral pieces from the films of the late 30s. Then, in 1950, with the premiere of 12 poems of Emily Dickinson, which we had heard about for years but never heard, a curtain was raised. Bliss was it then to be alive, at least for us young composers, all 12 of us, when every new work by Copland or Stravinsky or Shostakovich or Britain was greeted with ecstasy and the land was still rich with the enthusiasm of first times. Except for his arrangements of old American songs the following year, this cycle was the first and last foray into the genre by Copland. If today Dickinson is the poet of choice for American song composers, you'd think there was no one else. The choice was relatively unhackneyed in 1950. The settings of the poems, each dedicated to a fellow composer and each expertly self-contained, form a unified whole befitting cycles by Schumann or Faure. My favorite begins, quote, the world feels dusty when we stop to die. We want the dew then. Honors seem dry. I love Aaron too much to want to honor him. Instead, for this centennial, I offer him the preceding sentences like a dew-drenched valentine.